Pritchard. Drew Pritchard is one of Britain's leading decorative salvage dealers. Everything is just beautiful. He's on the hunt for weird and wonderful objects. What a thing. It's carved timber. This week on a tour which takes him from a former Suffolk airbase to the Derbyshire town of Chesterfield. It always surprises me, Chesterfield Spire. How isn't it falling over yet? Drew gets lucky with an extraordinary example of Victorian advertising art. What a thing. I'm having to contain my excitement, to be perfectly honest with you. And in the middle of a fast-moving house clearance. You've got a queue of people waiting to get in. Come through, come through. He goes back to the future. Hey, smash. Welcome to our childhood. Yeah. Mash, get smash, smash, yeah. get smashed. With help from the team. Ah, <gasps> see some gold. Drew draws on decades of expertise to discover the extraordinary and the unique. This is the stuff that really gets me excited. Drew's antiques business isn't just about acquiring the very old and the very rare. In fact, many of the objects he buys wouldn't be considered antiques at all. I have traditionally always bought things that aren't traditional. I will buy, yeah, very you know, wonderful 18th century English or continental furniture. I'll buy fine art occasionally, garden antiques. But the weird and the wonderful is something that I've always done, and I relish it, particularly anything that sort of that has the vaguest sniff of a bit of folk art, outsider art. I love that stuff. If you do have a very childishly done painting, if you do have a toy that's been made out of parts, the wonderful, the different, the interesting, and why not? Today, the boys are heading eastwards. It's a 300-mile drive down to Suffolk. But finding weird and wonderful objects sometimes means being ready to travel to weird and wonderful destinations. So we're on this Air Force Base, T, in the middle of Suffolk, and we're here to meet a guy called Paul, who runs a uh, antique business called Ting's Amazing Things. Wow, great name. He deals in really cool things, from what I've seen so far. I've seen a couple of things online of what he's doing. Uh, never met him, but he's based in one of the outbuildings on this massive ex-Air Force base. Incredible. Just a mile from the Suffolk village of Rendlesham, RAF Bentwaters played a key role in the Cold War when there were many United States Air Force planes stationed here. In the mid-1980s, the base hit the headlines following a series of UFO sightings, which were never fully explained. Closed as a military facility since 1993, one of the base's former fuel stores is today home to another collection of highly extraordinary objects. Curated by part-time events organizer turned dealer, Paul Thorpe. So I've been running this business for probably two years full-time now. So the things that I buy are purely things that I like. But typically, it would probably be older, maybe Victorian, Georgian pieces. Slightly macabre sometimes, things a little bit dark. I'm very excited to have Drew and T here because I admire Drew for the purchases that he makes. And if some of those can be from me, I'll be very happy. All right. Hello. Hi, T. Hi, Drew. How are you doing? Mate. How are you? Good, thanks. Love your building. It's great. It's Good. so cool. Come on in, have a look. Look at this. Love it. I've got to say, I think Paul's got the coolest warehouse in the country. It's a blast-proof building that was used to store um, fuel. I'm assuming plane fuel. How cool is that? That's really cool. Um, I like it. It's the perfect setting for what he's doing. Where's the name come from, then? Ting's Ting. Amazing Things. So I'm called Ting. It's an old nickname of mine. OK. Any and, reasons? Uh, um, an old boss of mine called me Ting. Um, don't quite know why. <laughs> and um, I thought when I started it, I want it to be about me and my pieces. Hence, Ting's Amazing Things. I love it. This is great. This is really good. Instantly, I'm struck by Paul's eye and his taste and what he's doing. He sells industrial antiques all the way through to sort of outsider art, and it's working. And um, I'm attracted immediately immediately to about five or six things. I'm going, ooh, I need to look more at that, I need to look at that. 
particularly after anything 18th century architecture at the moment. And OK. He fits right in. Wonderful little corner block. It's come from an 18th century English door casing. So as the door is in front of you like that, and you'd have the frame that goes round it, on the corner, there would be a block, and these would have painting in them or nothing. Sometimes they were plain. Sometimes they had these little plaster mouldings in it. And this is one. So this is from about 1790 to 1800. It's bang on there. It's English. It's got some original paint on it and really quite a nice mask on there as well. How much is he? 40. 40 quid. I'm not going to argue it. We'll get the ball rolling. I'll yep, have him. Let's do that. Yeah, thank you. It's 40 quid. So don't mess about with that one. We'll have that. Thank you very much. And we're off and running. We've done a bit of buying. Donico Brucciani. Marked? Yes. Lovely. A little bit of cracking on there. Yeah. That's a strange one to hang, that one. How's that going I've, on? I've had it hanging over the edge of something. Mm. It's got a great look to it. Yeah. We're having a good look around, and there's a plaster arm. I really like plaster work. This arm is actually by one of the better makers, uh, Brucciani, who worked a lot for the British Museum and the B&A to produce uh, moulds for them for display from originals. It's got a strange hang on this. So it's an arm like that, but it turns and the hang's there. So you can't hang it flat on a wall. You've got to hang it on a corner, which makes me like it even more. Cast in plaster in the early 20th century, this unusually conceived sculpture is an original work by Domenico Brusciani. Like many young Italians of his era, he likely crossed Europe on foot to escape poverty, selling cheap plaster sculptures on the streets along the way. But by the mid-19th century, Brusciani's Covent Garden business was copying artworks for museums across Europe. Even though it's in need of restoration, this example could be worth around £700. What are you asking for that? 500. God, they are expensive, aren't they? Brucciani's one of the names. Yeah. He's one of the names that you want with something like this. Let's come back to that as well. I'm really liking your stuff, Paul. I like what you're doing. Thank you. I really like it. It's great. It's only a small area. There's a few things I'm seeing straight away. So what I'm going to do is just ask the prices and, and just, just keep going and, 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 and just see if we maybe can put a few things together, maybe. Hey, look at this. <laughs> Mate, this is really good. Thank I you. I really like it. A couple of bits straight away. Really like him. I was told it was 17th century. It's 19th. Is it? Yes, okay. it's not 17th at all. It's a carved stone corbel of a male mask with hat on. It's just quite a haunting one. It's probably come from a building looking at the type of stone it is and the colour of it in the north of England, northwest of England, in fact, with that sort of colour. The, the reason it's that colour is down to smoke from chimneys from an industrial area. That is a beautiful piece of art, so that's something I definitely want. From the mid-19th century, it became common to add gravitas to the exteriors of mundane public buildings, such as labour clubs and police stations, by using decorative features previously reserved for churches like this graceful corbel. It could be worth around £800. How much is he? I uh, need 500 on that. He's got a great look to him. Yeah, yeah. He's just really good. Yeah. These are bones. Yes. Animal bones. I would believe cow bone. Cow bones, um, set into wood. Yes. Prisoner of war made. Well, they're Very as well. That's unusual. They're sort of a pair. Made <laughs> AD 1893. Love them. I mean, where, where did you get them from? I got them at auction. Now, these are two animal leg bones, probably from a cow, and sometimes it's called prisoner of war art, sometimes it's called trench art. They are... 19th century, late, marked underneath, um, no name, but they've used things that they had which were worth nothing. A bone and a bit of wood to create two vases. 
again, I've just fallen for them and I can't think of anything else. I'm just staring at those. They're just super things. What are you asking for them? I can do 450 to pair. Look, there's, there's three things I'm really interested in. Give me a second, let me go and get that on. Okay. So I bought this little fella. Yes. I like him. Like the Brookiani arm. So I'm interested in those and those, and this thing here, these as well. So I'd really like to buy him. Right. And this. Yes. And those. So it's, it's body parts. Yes. Bones, arms, and legs. I, I tend to buy body parts for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> like, Franken's, you're like Frankenstein. Maybe. <laughs> um, this is a bit of an issue, Paul. I would say it's literally coming sure. apart. Sure. Yeah. In front of me. Yeah, it certainly needs a. So that's going to have to be fixed. So, what can you do? The core, well, I said 500, didn't I? Yeah. Okay. Five, I think I said on that. Five on that one, and these were. 450. 450. Can do you 1350. The damage on the arm is really bothering me. 1100 quid? No. Very best I can do is 1250. That's it. In the surreal setting of a former Air Force base in Suffolk, Drew's chosen intriguing pieces from a weird and wonderful collection. It's body parts. Yes. Bones, arms, and I, I tend to buy body parts for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> like, Franken <you're> like Frankenstein. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and he's aiming for a package deal on three items which would otherwise cost him £1,450. Can do you... Thirteen fifty. The damage on the arm is really bothering me. Eleven hundred quid. No. Can do. Very best I can do is twelve fifty. That's it. Yep. Okay. I'll take them. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Paul. So we put the head, the two bone vases, and the Brookiani plaster arm and don't they work well together you know they just work instantly they work together and Paul says 1350 I try at 1100 and we meet in the middle around 1250 close enough for me I think you've got well, some inspired buys here yeah. I think that's these they're, are really an inspired I mean you picked out buy. the best I think they're great I really do have you got a torso and some legs and a source of electricity uh, a torso <laughs> up there <laughs> <laughs> Today I've really enjoyed actually meeting Paul. It hit all of my sort of sensibilities. He sold me on four things that I absolutely love. I could quite happily live with all of them forever. And that's when you're doing your right buying. It's been really great having Drew and T here today. Um, it's great to get that sort of affirmation of the type of things that I'm buying. I thought Drew would buy those very pieces, so it's. Uh, yeah, it sort of confirms my choices, really. That was great. Yes, fantastic. I liked that. I liked him and I loved the setup. Thought it was super. It's got the look and the things I bought off him, I couldn't be happier with those. The plaster arm, I have to get big Nicholas on it. He'll sort that right out for us. And buy of the day is that fantastic stone corbel. What a wonderful little thing that is over the moon with that. The next day, the boys are heading 120 miles due east of Conway to Chesterfield, where Drew's heard of a fledgling business with a name that promises both weirdness and wonders. So today, we are off to Chesterfield, and we are meeting Susie and Wayne, who run the uh, Lucky Magpie vintage showrooms. I don't think they've had the shop very long, but uh, apparently it's working a treat, and I think they've got some um, barns and stuff for us to have a look at as well. Excellent. Great area, isn't it? Yeah, super. So what do you Beautiful. think of Chesterfield Spire, then? It always surprises me, Chesterfield Spire. I look at it and I'm like, how? Why? Yeah. How, 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 how? How isn't it falling over yet? 
The famous twist in the town's 14th century church spire is thought to be the effect of unseasoned timber or heavy lead sheeting used in its construction. A prosperous town since Roman times, at the height of the Industrial Revolution, locally engineered machinery traveled from Chesterfield to all corners of the British Empire, thanks in part to one resident, George Stevenson, father of the railways. Today, by another twist of the tale, a rich mix of extraordinary objects from far-flung places have found their way to the town and been gathered under one roof by dealer duo Susie Kiovinsky and Wayne Kurtz. So the name The Lucky Magpie Salvage came from um, my time of volunteering at an animal sanctuary. It's an eclectic mix of finds. For me personally, having something that feels a bit like a Willy Wonka antique center where you can come in and you just get immersed in all the different rooms. The color, the quirkiness, the things that you can probably remember from your childhood and what brought you good memories. I'm really looking forward to Drew and T coming. From what I know of Drew, he's going to pick out something completely different to what people are expecting. And that's what I'm super excited about, without a doubt. Thank you. Here you come. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? You're right. Hi. Hey. Susie, nice to Hello. meet you. Hello, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Drew. Drew. T. T. Wayne. Hi. OK. A lot to see. Definitely. Welcome yeah. to the Lucky Magpie Salvage. Wow. Whoa. It's different. <laughs> like it. Wow. Yeah. It's a bright, colourful place rammed full of stuff. A lot of signage, there's fairground, showman art, there's uh, display cases, all sorts. Make it fun, make it affordable, and you'll do well. And that's exactly what I think they're doing here. So, I mean, how long, how long have you guys been here? I'm always interested to know how long somebody's yeah. sort of kept at it and been doing it, and, you know, um, at the shop and all that. Because people don't realise it's such a lot of work. It is. Really hard work. Work. it is really hard work, but we've been open eight months here. Yeah. Prior to that, we were doing fairs. We get three or four days, at least every month, where we just set off in the van. No, book, no hotels, we don't yeah. book any hotels, do we? We just see, see where we'll, we end we'll up. set off and see where we end up, and then we'll get leads during the day, and, and then we come back with a van full of stuff. <laughs> I like it. We've got lots of things that I like the look of. Easy push, loved them. They were all over at Flandid New when we were kids. There's stuff everywhere. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Where'd you get that from? Front of an house, it was out an house clearance. Yeah. Can you pull it out for us, Wayne? It's heavy. Do you know why? I don't think it's that old, but it, it's, it's kind of cool. I think it's if sort it of got a look, a look to it, hasn't it? How much yeah. is it? Weird thing. It's like a dopey, a dopey stag. <laughs> Best that I could do on it would be 120. Right, okay. Sometimes I wonder about myself. I was I was wandering around the shop and there's this shield with a big sort of comical looking stag's head on it. And instantly I thought, oh, I like that. And I shouldn't really like it because it's not very good, really, but it's got something about it. And it's clearly something somebody's made themselves. They've made up a mould and made it themselves because they wanted to have an armorial, you know, shield on the front of their house. £100 buy it? You don't have to. Yeah. 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 Sold. Sold. Brilliant. What the hell am I going to do with that? It was £120, got it for 100 I think we can strip a top layer of paint off it and end up with something sort of a bit more distressed paint underneath there. And I think it'll be really interesting. It's just an oddball thing. It's just oddball. And that's enough. It just goes on and on. It does just go on Long and safety. on. Right then, in your workshop. They're really interesting. Beautiful Sheffield. Oh, what does that say? Some Armitage and Sons. Yeah. Manchester and Sheffield. Sheffield. Yeah, so they've got some local history. The lady I bought them off, her husband found them at the tip about 40 years ago. He worked at the tip in Buxton. The, the painted terracotta. Yeah. Cast terracotta. And then you put them all sorts, front of buildings, shops, underneath bits of, you know, on the, on the front of a desk. I mean, they can go anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got either side yeah. of a door. Yeah. You could do anything with them, really. Yeah. I would like to buy two. Well, on the seat, there's a four or five terracotta corbels with paint on them. And these are great. These are fascinating. So these are actually 19th century. And they've got the maker's mark clear as day in two places on them. And they're numbered as well, 21, which would have been the design number from the catalogue that you'd have picked them from. 
They're one of those tiny little details of, an, an architectural details that you are not going to see very often. That's fascinating. Before the mid 19th century, bricks were made by hand. But by the time these corbels were made by John Armitage and Son, a successful Manchester brick and tile factory, which began manufacturing in the 1850s, production had been mechanized. Much cheaper than carving from wood or stone, architectural decorative fixtures like this could now be mass produced and picked out from a catalog. In an unusual state of preservation with traces of original paint, this pair could be worth around 250 pounds. Um. 140 for the pair. Yes, at a top price of 150, so we're, you're on the nail. You're yeah. bang on yeah. with that. To yeah. be honest with you, you're bang on with yeah. that. Okay. I buy two 140 pounds. Lovely. And then Wayne said they were found on a tip. I don't know. There's something magical about that, isn't there? Love them. Brilliant. Yes. Fantastic. Hooray. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> right. Let's welcome. keep going. Susie and Wayne have got some storage on a farm nearby, and um, we thought we'd come over and have a look. It's just up this way. Farms are perfect for storage, and stuff gets left here for a long time. So, yeah, we definitely want to see that. We love these. Yeah. What have we got in here, then? If you just want to come through... Oh, yes. OK, we have the storage of some other pieces. Chapel chairs. Have. I bought 700. 700? Wow. Uh, that is a lot. I've bought lots, but that's a lot. Oh, hello. What, uh, what about this? That was a barn find. Stunning artwork on it, the illustration. Can I get it out? Yeah, sure. Do you want me to just move? Oh, hi. Oh, here you go. There's no tea like Phillips. And something strikes me and I'd like, wow. And I sort of am having to contain my excitement, to be perfectly honest with you. Because there's the nicest enamel sign I've ever seen. It's portrait, not landscape. It's very vibrant. There's lots and lots of movement in the piece. It's still crystal clear what it is. It's just got it all. It's got that something special. One of the earliest forms of mass advertising, the process of making enamel signs like this one, was patented in the mid 19th century. To create the image, powdered glass in different colours was meticulously poured onto a metal surface, then heated to a very high temperature, causing the glass to seep into the pores of the metal. This stunningly skillful example advertising the 19th century London-based tea company Philips & Co could be worth around £1,450. How much is that? I think I've got... Got 1800 on that. How much is it, really? I mean, that, I, it, it's a nice one. And that's just it. It's a nice one. Yeah. Um, 1400 would be my best on it. Really? Hmm. Um, um, I'd like to pay a thousand pounds for it. So, but I know you can't. Can you do 1,200 quid? Best we can do on it is 13.50. In Chesterfield, Drew's found a crammed to the rafters emporium with a whimsical mix of items that sparked his imagination. Sold. Sold, brilliant. What the hell am I going to do with that? Back it's here. just different. And tucked away in the back of a barn, an exceptional piece of 19th century advertising has him trying to contain his excitement. Um, can you do 1,200 quid? Best we can do on it is 13.50. It's hard, Wayne, isn't he? Mm. Yeah. Very. Yeah. He loves his yeah. antique advertising. He does. And they don't turn up. 13.50 sold. So, thank you. Brilliant, thank you. What a thing. Beautiful in term. And we end up at 1,350, which is the most I've ever paid for an enamel sign. So it must be something special, because it really feels it. It's a stonker. You're so lucky to have all this space. 
Yeah, it's been a work in progress. Well, it never ends, does it? Yeah. Either. I do like, there's a couple of pots here I like the look of. Now, I yeah. know they're only concrete and I know yeah. they're only about 20, 30 years old, mm -hmm. but I do like the look of them. They've definitely yeah. got that aged look to them. Yeah. So, can we just yeah. gather these together? So we've now come outside, and there's not a lot of things here, but then I spot two things, I think, oh, I like those, and then another two, and then another two, and then another two. And I think, yeah, they look great as a group, don't they? Pair of the, so how much are they? Um, well, well, I can do the, the oh. lot for 350. Sold. Lovely. Great. Excellent. Right, let's get the van. Thank you, guys, thank you. Marvellous. My day with Lucky Magpie and, and with Wayne and Susie has been been wonderful, actually. I've really enjoyed myself. We bought fun, interesting things that will just make a garden look great, corner of a room look great. And then buying one of the nicest things I've bought in ages, is, it's always a pleasure. The Lucky Magpie, for me, has been very lucky today. Drew and T visit has been absolutely fantastic. We've had so much fun. There's been some really good deals that have been made. Yeah, it's been great. I'm just so glad that he picked an enamel sign. So for him to pick that piece out makes it all worthwhile, all the early mornings and all the hundreds and hundreds of miles to, to get these finds for his customers. Sorted? Yeah. Cool. Nice, nice signs in. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Sounds Much appreciated. Yeah. No Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. And uh, Thank good luck you. with what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Thank Thanks. You. If you find anything again. like that again, give us a shout. <laughs> Enjoy. Will do. Enjoy. Thanks, guys. See you, See you later. later. Bye. Bye. What do you think of my £1,350 piece of enamel? It's a very nice £1,350. Is it £1,350 worth of nice, though? Well, as you said before, find another one. Yeah. Back in Wales, the extraordinary plaster by 19th century master Domenico Bruciani has gone straight from Suffolk to the Clondidnoll studio of sculptor and restorer Nick Elphick. Oh, it's a teaching aid for artists. They'll draw from it, you know, and it's fantastic, actually. It's beautiful. So he hasn't told me exactly what's wrong with it, but I can pretty much see there's a crack that goes all the way through it. Yeah, it has a pin in it. So there's nothing... I don't want to take this off because it's already pinned. Having inserted a metal pin to hold two broken pieces in position, the previous restorer has tried to fill the crack and hide the repair. But because the wrong filler was used, the crack has reopened. There we go, look. There's a chunk of resin that's just come out of that. So they've used the plastic material to fix an old plaster piece. And the problem is with that is the reason why it doesn't work in the long run, when this goes into someone's house, you have houses that get hot and cold, and all materials, you know, change uh, temperature and they shrink and, and expand. And if you've got a hard, dense material like plastic, it's going to basically start to... Uh, it won't contract the same as the plaster, so it'll all start to eventually fall apart. But I think that's probably enough. I just want to... Just enough so I can get in there. <sighs> to make sure his repair is more successful, Nick mixes a dense plaster, which will set hard. I'm being quite messy about this because it's more important that it gets into right into the nooks and crannies, right in there, nice and packed. When the new plaster has almost set... It's starting to go off nicely. The way to tell if it's gone off is just go over with your nail. It feels hard and doesn't come off too, too much under your nail. It means it's gone off. It's sanded to mimic the smoothness of the original surface. Just go over with a nice sponge and clean it off. Nice and easy. But the real challenge of this restoration is still to come. Yeah. Okay. It's quite a simple job, but the thing that's difficult is hiding the crack afterwards with patination. You just need to blend these colours and make it look a little bit more natural. And this is obviously, um, you know, it was obviously just a sort of patination green. This is just years and years of people's fingers touching and all the grease from the fingers. Now what I'm doing is I'm just going to try and break up this line, probably just making some of this green, going through this line a few times here and there, break it up, and then also putting some of this pink in there. I'm going to put a bit of this in there to, to dull it down a little bit, and then put a little bit of white in there. Get in there. So 
you can see now this is starting to break up nicely. So I'm going to go over with a very hard cap wax. So you just have a look here. So you can see this is sort of all white and dry. I'm literally going to go very quickly straight over. And look, it all starts to blend. Just gives it a nice depth. Nice finish. I want to put it on very, very fi finely. Um, and then you just let that dry. I'm going to go over the whole thing with it. So once this has a nice sheen over it, you're not, no one's going to know it's had a restoration because it'll just, the surface will look. See, it's just blending that green. It's giving it a nice depth. And now I'm just going to get a dry sponge very quickly. I don't want to rub too hard, but literally just polish. Just give it a sheen. And that's it. I think Drew will be happy with that going on a wall. While the Bruciani arm comes back to life, the boys are on the road again, this time heading 270 miles southeast to Cheam, close to the edge of London. Drew's hoping the sheer volume of objects on offer at their destination will make for weird and wonderful pickings. So uh, today we are in Cheam and we are uh, off to see Think Vintage House Clearance. I love a house clearance. I mean, you'll never do a harder day's work. It's like digging a hole, you know, all this stuff up and down, up and down the stairs, yeah. filthy, dirty, covered in dust, covered in, you know, old skin, toenails. It's about the least glamorous bit of the antiques trade. And this is what these boys are doing. They're doing it right at the, the, the sharp end of it. So quantity. Quantity and lots of it, yeah. I'm, I'm excited about this one. I'm excited about this one. Where the chalky South Downs meet the clay of the London Basin, water pushed to the surface in the form of a line of springs resulted in a string of human settlements dating back centuries, which today includes towns like Ewell and Cheam. Springing up here in more recent decades is a business which has now become a mighty river of objects gathered from house clearances far and wide, ranging from the very ordinary to the very strange. Barely contained in two warehouses, Think Vintage is run by longtime friends Paul Stiller and Chris Whiting on the site of Paul's dad's former hardware warehouse. Every job's totally different. We get houses that can be full of antiques, houses that can be full of all sorts of different sort of things. But uh, yeah, in amongst them, you do get some good ones. As you can see, I mean, this is just the overspill that we've got down the side here. We're incredibly busy, so we've got stuff coming in and vans coming in on a daily basis. So the stock changes on a daily basis. We never know. Until it's really back here and the vans are back here being unloaded, we just don't know what we're going to get. So it's lots of surprises. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? How are we doing? Hello, Drew. Hello, Steve. Right. How are you doing? Good to see you. Yeah. Good. Thanks Good. Coming down. Here. Yeah. No, I'm looking forward to this. This is how, how it all began. This is a job in Streatham. So what will happen is, as you see it coming off, yeah. um, Paul and Carlos will check through it. Some of the more interesting things will go into Paul's office in the warehouse. Yeah. And some of the more generic will go down the alleyway for sorting. Well, that's an easy seller, isn't it? Give it's that cool. a coat of wax. Yeah. That's going to be out straight away. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. We've got Incredible. a queue of people waiting to get in. Come through, come through. Morning. 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 As soon as we arrive, a Luton turns up, back goes up, it's a fresh house clearance. This is somebody's entire life in the back of a van. There's literally a queue. The van comes in, there's a queue of people waiting to get in the back. In that van and in every single house, there could be that nugget of gold and you've just got to find it. Oh, my word. <laughs> so this yeah. is just an extension of what comes off the vans. Yeah, just every day, all yeah, day. Yeah, well, this is it. It just builds and builds, builds and builds. And this is technically about a quarter of the warehouse. So you can hear in the background, somebody's playing one of the pianos, there's people walking on around us. It's a vibrant atmosphere, you know, and I've got to be honest, I absolutely love it. And um, it takes a long time of just being in amongst this stuff before you start to see the jewels. You have to be around it to learn what's good and what's bad. Oh, man, house clearance is just the best. <laughs> Where did you get this? That came out of a loft. 
We think, we believe it's a, a bit of advertising from a bank, believe it or not. What a thing. It's carved timber. Yes. Looks like it. It's Giltwood. Do you know when you walk in somewhere and I go, my God, look at that. And there's a great big locust, cricket, grasshopper. Got up closer to it and I thought, my God, it's wood. It's carved and wood. And underneath all that horrible brown, cheap paint, it's gilded properly underneath it. I'm like, wow, look at this. What, what do you want for that, boys? Uh, realistically, it's got a little bit of damage on there. I would be looking at about, about 100 quid. In Surrey, Drew's on the hunt for the unusual amongst a giant menagerie of house clearance finds. Oh, my word. <laughs> and he's come face to face with an extraordinary mid 20th century giltwood beastie. What, what do you want for that, boys? Uh, realistically, it's got a little bit of damage on there. I would be looking at about, about 100 quid. Sold. Yeah? Thank you very much, yeah. That's a highly desirable piece. Highly desirable. Boom. <laughs> We're making money. Straight away. Cannot believe my luck. So the prop departments must love you. Absolutely, yeah. Our clientele tends to be general public, second-hand dealers and set dressers. There's this sign. It says, wait That's something right. for... Third wait class. here for third class. Yeah, pass the sign. Is that for fourth. sale? That can be for sale. It's knackered, uh, but I really like it. It is knackered, yeah, but it's a good sign. It's... Wait here for third class. I just like what it actually says. If it, it said yeah. sort of second class or it wouldn't have been as good, third class just makes it it's a good, quirky thing. We're wandering around all, all the room and the guys have got lots of signs everywhere. They seem to like signs. They've got loads on the wall downstairs. And one of them immediately struck me, wait here for third class. This will more than likely have been, obviously, a train station. But this one harks back to a time when first, second and third class really meant something. From the beginning of the railway age in Europe, three classes were offered, with the most luxurious being first class and only wooden benches for third class passengers. By the end of the 19th century, it was actually second class which had disappeared from virtually all British trains, with most passengers relegated to third, a categorization which was to continue until the 1950s. Dating from the early 20th century, with its unapologetic text, this enamel sign could be worth around £300. Condition, obviously not brilliant. Uh, I'd say condition bad. Condition very bad. I wasn't going to say that, but yeah, OK. Uh, Carried. 150. Charming. 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 One, 150. 100 quid? Yeah, go on in, we do that Sound for you. Lovely. Yeah, Sold. Done. Thank you. Yeah, the third class makes it. You're dead yeah. on. Not please wait. Not, do you mind? Wait. Third class, just wait. That's got so many nuances to it in, in the British snobbery society that we unfortunately live in. It's got something great about it. It's just got it. That's all it has. It just has got it. This is going to be used as a marketplace area. We're going to have a record store, we're going to have a jewellery store, we're going to have a boutique, we're going to have sort of various different shops up here. Right there. This. But it looks good in here. A tennis racket. We have bought these before. Can I do the gag from last time again? Yeah, go on. Imagine the size of his balls. <laughs> <laughs> right. Top office. Right. Top office. Top office. Right, OK. On tray. Oh, uh, OK, OK. So stuff will come up in here. We want to keep it out of the warehouse. Just give us a chance to kind of inventorise and go through stuff, do a bit of research. There's one thing that's behind you, which I've... T, you're going to love this. You're going to love this. Oh, oh yeah. Hey? Yeah. Smash. Welcome to our childhood. Yeah. yeah. Mash, mash, get smash. Smash, smash, get smash. <gasps> <laughs> Come on, son. Yes! Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> but check this one out, what we believe to be a Picasso. 
that's been looked at, yeah, they seem to think it's real as well. So. He'd very often do drawings for people at restaurants. And exactly. Yeah, just just yeah. 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 Things yeah, he would, yeah. Look at the raised eyebrow. Everything about it's got so many quirks that are him. Yeah. What's it valued at? Not been valued yet. There's ones on, on the internet that are going 500, 800 quid. We are now in another part of the guy's setup, and they call this is the office, and this is full of the things that they think's got a bit of a chance. Things that might be worth just a little bit more, including, including, believe it or not, a Picasso that they think is right. They've showed it to me. I think so too. I think it's absolutely dead right. You never know what's going to come out of a house clearance, a Picasso. This has caught my eye. Polar bear. 56 of 75. Horace something Williamson. Beautifully done. It's lovely, yeah. Water damaged. Nice though, isn't it? Hmm. This striking image of a characterful polar bear probably dates from the early 20th century. A signed and numbered etching in excellent original condition, it could be worth around 150 pounds. 30 quid. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Yeah? Yeah, cool. That's about right. I really like that. I know instantly that I want to pay 25 quid for it, you know, but I end up giving them 30 pounds for it. Now, it's signed, dated, and numbered. And it's good. Right then, guys. Uh, I think I'm done. Superb. Fantastic. I love, house, I love house clearance. Thank you for letting us have a wander around. No worries at all. Right, our pleasure. On. Shall we um, stick it all in the van? Let's yep. get it done. Let's do it. Thank you, Jen. What can I say? I, I couldn't have enjoyed today more. It's doing what I love to do, and it's doing it in such a simple and pretentious way. It's fun. It harked back to how I began doing it. it. Seems like five minutes ago. I think the boys here, Paul and Chris, have got such a fantastic business. If I lived near here, I'd be coming every day because you just don't know what you're going to find. And today proved that. It proved it within two minutes of me walking through the door. I bought something extraordinary which I adore. It's been great fun. They've gone round, uh, picked some bits and pieces out. I hope they go home happy. The locusts, I think, came from a bank. I think that was a bit of bank sort of uh, advertising from back in the day. The third class sign, it's all about the word third. Love that. That was just, uh, that's what made that sign. Can't Good tell you what you. a great day I've had. No, same here. It's been super really cool. Thanks, Thanks. Drive later. carefully. Take, Take care. care. Cheers, right. boys. See you later. So getting offered Picassos, yeah. buying three-foot-long gold grasshoppers and third-class train signs. All in a day's work. Yeah, it's the standard, really. Standard. Yeah. yeah, a good one. I like Think Vintage. We'll go back there. I've spent the week buying all sorts of things, but a lot of the weird and wonderful, which are things I really like. Probably the best of them is the carved stone face, the architectural element really well carved from a single piece of sandstone. I get the same kick, right? Say I found a fabulous 18th century marble wine system, or I'll find a concrete dog that somebody's painted quite badly and it's got wonky eyes. I get the same kick. Something just has to have a certain something, and a certain something is something I don't think about too much, but I know it when I see it. Today and this week, I've been full of it. Thank you.